Thank you very much, Anya. Um, great to be here. We've got a very important topic, arguably the topic, um, is how, how the US is handling China, whether it's going well or not. And a brilliant panel that Anya has just introduced um, to discuss this. So let, let me just start by asking, I think most of you, I'm not sure you were here yesterday, but most of the rest of us saw um, Steve Clement's very memorable interview with the Chinese ambassador this time yesterday, in which the Chinese ambassador said, and it's becoming something of a tradition for Chinese ambassadors to give memorable interviews in Aspen, in which he said um, that, look, we have very different political systems, China and America, we have very different ways of viewing the world, we have very different traditions, but the world's big enough for both of us. Um, we can get along. Um, it's not a zero-sum game. He didn't use those words, but that's what he meant. Essentially a case for peaceful coexistence. So my question, starting with you, Joe, um, is do you believe him? Uh, I'm not sure I believe any ambassador who is a salesman for his country. Uh, this doesn't refer to the Chinese ambassador alone. But from an analytical point of view, I think he's right that the U.S.-China relationship doesn't have to be zero-sum. Uh, let me give you two reasons. One is China and the U.S. don't present existential threats to each other. China's too big for us to invade or change. The U.S. is too big for China to invade or change. The only way we'd be an existential threat to each other was if we blundered into war, which is possible. Then, in fact, you would go from non-zero-sum to zero-sum. The second reason I'd give is that when you look at the U.S.-China challenge, um, it's all too simple to say it's a new Cold War. Trouble is that makes it too easy for us. The situation is really like three-dimensional chess where you play not only against one board horizontally, you have to play three boards vertically as well. So on the top board of military competition, uh, it is like the Cold War. We and the Soviets had uh, military competition, which was close to zero sum. Uh, and it, it, in that board, the Americans still are the preeminent global military power. China's coming up fast, but it, it can't project military power globally like we can. But if you go to the second board, which is economic relations, the world is multipolar and has been for two decades. There you have US, China, Europe, and Japan, all as the great powers. And that's a different game. And then the bottom board is transnational relations, things that cross borders outside the control of governments. Good examples, of course, are climate change or pandemics. And there, it makes no sense to talk about uh, polarities or zero-sum or non-zero-sum, there's absolutely no way in the world we can solve climate or handle pandemics with simply looking at it as power over others. It has to be power with others. So in that sense, it's intrinsically got a large non-zero-sum or positive-sum component to it. And if you go back to my metaphor and you say, I've got to play this vertically as well as horizontally, if we just focus on the top board and pretend we're playing the Cold War again, we're going to miss out on the second and third boards. So I think for those two reasons, uh, it, it is not a zero-sum game. And to the extent that we call it one, uh, we make our job too easy. Uh, OK. And Naima, I'd like to sort of pose the same question to you slightly differently. I mean, now, you're a Chinese speaker, right? And you're a, you're a former Foreign Service officer. You were based in China for a while. Um, you're, no, you're now at Princeton, specializing, amongst other things, in Chinese foreign policy. So you've sort of seen the whole arc, the sort of kind of bipolar swings of our vision of what China can be. And it, at the beginning of this century, it was very much positive sum. Um, it was very much China would enter the WTO, it would relax politically more and more as it developed economically, much as South Korea had, as Singapore is, as Taiwan um, had. And then Xi Jinping comes along, and you have the 19th Party Congress in 2017, 
elevates himself to immortal, the, the Mao Deng level, abolishes term limits. China turns very hawkish. And our view of, the, of China goes from the win-win, arguably very naive, win-win vision we had of it at the beginning of the century to a win-lose. Maybe not all of our um, views, but uh, that seems to have been the swing in Washington. Have we overcorrected? It's a great question. Um, so in addition to all those things that you said about me, I also just got back from China on Saturday. And I was part of the first uh, academic delegation from the United States to go to China after the pandemic. I went with an organization called the National Committee on US-China Relations. So it's an organization that's been around since the 60s. But the whole point of the organization is to bring together people who think about China a lot and to facilitate dialogue between the US and Chinese sides. Um, it's interesting because in our conversations with uh, scholars with some officials, both at the national and the local level, with people at think tanks. The terminology of win-win, gong ying, is what they would say in China, is still very much used. And I think we saw that also in the conversation um, with Ambassador Xie yesterday. Um, but certainly we don't hear that termino terminology in Washington being used anymore. Um, I actually like the way that Joe broke it down because I think that though the scope of the US relationship with China is much more limited these days because of the increasing competition between the two sides, there are still areas where the relationship is zero sum or is positive sum actually. So zero sum is on the military side, right? It's hard for you to have a positive sum relationship with a country where you have competition militarily. But if you think about the economic relationship, there's a de-risking category, that the areas where national security is a concern, but then there are also a number of areas of trade, sectors of trade, where we continue to have a very important trade relationship with China. So if you think about uh, consumer electronics, TVs, sound devices, if you think about agriculture, if you think about um, household items, toys, things like this, still a lot of robust trade and a very, very strong interconnected economic relationship because there has to be. And so positive sum continues to be the domain in which we should just talk about the economic relationship when we're not talking about the categories of risk. I also would say climate change is an important area where, as Joe said, it's hard to think about a zero sum relationship. That's my thought. An interesting answer. I mean, you mentioned toys and I guess soy, soy et cetera, but the real sort of activity in any economy is, is in semiconductors. Um, and it, of course, any semiconductor for civilian peaceful economic use can also be dual use, civ mill. Um, and Kristen, I wanted to ask you about this, because again, another memorable line in Ambassador Gier's interview yesterday um, was that, look, this is like a swimming competition. The, the, the restrictions that you're imposing um, on semiconductors and high-tech exports to China um, is like asking us to turn up to a swimming competition with old-fashioned swimming gear and you're wearing Speedos. So um, I don't risk, wish to sort of focus too much on that visual, um, <laughs> but it is a very memorable one. Um, and what he's essentially saying, and I'm, I'm posing this to you, Kristen, and I'm going to get to you in a second, Mike, because I know you have a lot to say on this too, is, is that America has switched to seeing economics, not just military, as a zero-sum game, that you are attempting to stymie our economic development. Is there any basis, in, in your view, from a business perspective, to, to that Chinese interpretation of our actions? Well, before I get to the semiconductor question, I just want to respond quickly to Professor Nai and Naima on the zero-sum question, because there's another alternative. Um, it's not just zero sum versus win-win. Um, the other alternative in public choice theory and also global economics is a negative sum scenario. You know, zero sum, as you all know, the size of the pie stays the same and it's just a question of who gets the pieces, but there's a scenario where the pie shrinks, where the nature of the competition means there's less security, less prosperity. Um, and so to me, the real challenge for the U.S. and kind of waging global economic competition is avoiding that scenario, is avoiding bifurcation of the global economy in a way that sort of um, impacts us negatively across the board. Um, there are some positive sum scenarios, I think. Actually, Megan O'Sullivan, who's here somewhere, has a really interesting piece that goes to a point you mentioned about climate change, where she argues um, in the FT this week that 
competition between the US and China for market share over green technologies may spur more progress on climate change than some of the cooperative kind of, you know, COP and various summits um, cooperative approach did. And that would be example of a positive, positive sum scenario. On semiconductors, I mean, this really goes to the heart of the challenge because what the U.S. has articulated, the, both the Biden administration and also the select committee, is that the U.S. is trying to de-risk, trying to address key national security risks in our economic relationship without provoking a broader decoupling, so keeping trade and investment relationship on non-sensitive issues. But that's extremely hard to do for a lot of reasons. Um, one is it's hard to develop limiting principles on how you articulate those things. Two, the nature of technology and the nature of the Chinese system make that very hard. Um, and three, we're by definition in a tit for tat, and so the U.S. could attempt a de-risking but then provoke a response that leads to a broader decoupling. And semiconductors is the perfect example of the challenge here because on the one hand, the administration, you know, Mike Gallagher, for example, the select committee has said one of the principles around de-risking is that we shouldn't provide technology or finance that could advance the Chinese military. Very, very reasonable principle. But some of the most interesting technologies, advanced semiconductors, artificial intelligence, are by definition dual use. Um, and the nature of you know, Chinese civil military fusion means that you have to assume that civil applications have potential military uses. And so I don't think the administration is intending to provoke a kind of broader impact on the Chinese economy. I don't think they're trying to stifle Chinese growth or, I don't know, spur more youth unemployment. But the fact is you can't get at these core technologies without having a broader impact on the, the kind of future of the technology. And I think the core thing, you know, one of the core things missing from the administration's strategy is to start to articulate what are the limiting principles that are going to help us decide um, this is appropriate for, this is, a, you know, within our, um, within our high fence. Um, small yard. But small yard. Uh, well, we're going to hear directly tomorrow from Jake Sullivan about that. But, but Mike, I mean, that very memorable phrase that Jake outlined, that this is limited, this isn't a an attempt to limit China's uh, um, development or growth, um, the small yard, high fence. Um, now, what um, Kristen said sort of implies that small yard is just going to, you know, by the logic of these actions, get larger over, over time, that there are so many things that can be deployed for Chinese military modernization that we're going to see um, an expansion of, of uh, restricted goods and, um, and technologies. Is that, is that a, a correct fear? And if, it's, if it is, um, what do you think that we can do to make this more precise and, and more transparent? Well, first of all, to go to your, your first question to Joe and, and build on that because it links to this. I think whether it's a zero-sum relationship going forward in, in many ways is in China's hands to decide because I think the U.S. approach has been actually quite nuanced to say we're going to compete in certain areas, there are areas of potential cooperation, there are areas of potential conflict that we need to manage. We've sort of delinked elements of the relationship in a way that we didn't do during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Then linkage was the, the primary dynamic where every issue related to every other issue. It's the Chinese who've responded by saying, well, we're not really willing to talk about cooperation on climate change unless you demonstrate you're willing to accept our views of, of critical interests in Taiwan or, or South China Sea. And I think, the, so the question will be, can we pursue a positive sum relationship that recognizes that there are these three tracks of potential activity, the three levels, perhaps, of, of Joe's, uh, of Joe's uh, chess game? You know, on, the, uh, on, the, on the, the small yard, by the way, the small yard with the high fence uh, originated with Secretary Gates back during the early Obama administration when we were reforming the export control system and trying to make the, 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 the yard smaller and focus on the things that truly mattered. It may get larger or not, but I think it's, it, it goes too far to say the entire economic relationship with China is dependent on semiconductors and advanced technologies that might have dual use capabilities. It's a much broader relationship than that. Secretary Yellen, I think, was quite right when she said there's a lot of uncontroversial trade that can continue, and we ought to be able to make that distinction between uncontroversial trade and areas where we really compete or have national security implications. 
I wasn't there for the speech yesterday, but my response to the Speedo would be that when we go to the Olympics, different countries have different equipment and different capabilities. It's not the obligation of one country to enable the other country to be able to compete more aggressively with it. And that's what competition means, in fact, is that each country is going its own way. In the green energy uh, uh, area, that's having very positive effects. When it comes to semiconductors and other potential use, it's not our obligation to help the Chinese succeed in competing with us in that regard. And that, that's where I think uh, there's, there's potential to manage it in a different way than conflict. I want to get more into the negative some military side in Taiwan in a second, but just, Mike, to, now that I've got you on the subject, Jake um, is going to be asked tomorrow about the new Washington consensus, um, as he calls it, and uh, the foreign policy for the middle class. Now, one of these things involves not doing old-fashioned trade deals, such as the one, ones you've been involved in. You were former USTR. You negotiated TPP. Clearly, they're off the agenda. I remember that, yes. You remember that well. Um, clearly, they're off the agenda, and this is bipartisan. Um, so my question to you is, if we're evaluating the effectiveness of the Biden administration's approach to China, is the lack of appetite for striking trade and investment deals with China's neighbors, with others in the Indo-Pacific region, is this a handicap in, in the Biden administration's ability to pursue that goal? So first of all, I, I think it is healthy for both the, uh, the people who were sort of instinctually pro-free trade and the people who were instinctually anti-free trade, both to be somewhat self-critical and introspective and see what the lessons are over the last uh, decade or so. Um, I'm not sure one speech equals a consensus, by the way. I think there is sort of still a variety of views around where, what the new paradigm is going, uh, going forward. Uh, there are many ways to achieve, I think, a middle class uh, and uh, trade policy or uh, trade policy that works for, for Amer American workers and farmers, including by opening other markets to our exports, including by using the power of trade agreements to raise labor standards around uh, the world, and including by imposing protectionism. So that's there are three different ways of, of using trade to protect American workers. Or to, and, and we need to be looking, I think, at, at all three. Um, I think the, the reality is the politics behind trade have shifted dramatically and we should find ways in, within that context of what's permissible to engage with other countries and have them at the table. Right now, it's the Indo-Pacific economic framework that's on offer. And I would spend as much effort as we can fleshing out the, the bones of that, of that framework that Secretary Raimondo and Ambassador Tai and, and, the, and the White House have been working on to make it as meaningful um, as possible to be something that other countries want to be part of and see value in working with the United States on. Uh, but I do see that over the last weekend, the United Kingdom joined uh, uh, the, 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 the TPP follow-up uh, follow uh, agreement, and there's a long list of other countries that are interested in joining, including China. And the current members of CPTPP are gonna have to figure out whether they let China in or not. Uh, I think we would be at a great disadvantage if the major economic frameworks and infrastructure, which by the way, have a, a very significant influence on where you put supply chains. The most powerful tool in, uh, uh, in locating supply chains is what you do with tariffs. Go through your closet. I've done this with my children, which may say something about my parenting, but if you go through your closet and show them where their clothes come from, all of their clothes come from a trade agreement country or a country that benefits from some trade arrangement. And that's because when we eliminate tariffs, production goes there and it becomes part of our supply chain. So again, I, I urge people on both sides of this debate to think about if you care about resilient supply chains, you care about diversification of supply chains, which is very important, think about all the tools that may be useful in that regard, um, including trade tools. Ed, may I? Sorry. Yeah, please. Um, I just want to disagree with the premise. I'm not sure trade deals are as dead politically as you'd think. Um, I mean, I think there's lots of hostility at USTR to new trade deals, and I think there's hostility among progressive Democrats, but otherwise I think there's room actually for, um, for the administration or maybe whoever's present in 2025 to think about binding trade deals, high standard trade deals with IPEF countries. Um, think about USMCA, which passed you know, both houses in 2019 and 2020 with enormous margins. Um, my 
my view is, BRT's view, is that the failure to push the envelope on this is having enormous consequences, economic consequences, like Mike just mentioned, um, and making it more difficult for companies to diversify their supply chains. All of the tariff issues he mentioned, the inability to negotiate binding um, tariffs with, uh, with countries, some of whom maintain very high tariffs on U.S. exports, failure to negotiate investor protections, intellectual property protections. Um, and maybe even more importantly than all those economic impacts, it's having a really devastating geopolitical impact in that it's sending a signal to the region that we're not in it for the long haul, that we've lost our stomach on these things. And so, so our view is the administration really needs to think about kind of beefing up IPEF um, and, and looking to more ambition on their trade agenda. Just very, very briefly though, would it be fair to say, I mean, in the, the previous win-win world that I characterized earlier, business in Washington was of one voice and it was very in favor of engaging with China and with mixed results um, for business as well. Um, it, would it be fair to say, and particularly with your members, the senior CEOs across America, there is no consensus um, amongst business now and therefore there is no business voice? I hope there's a business voice since that's, well, what, yeah, no that's one, what BRT there's does. There's no one um, business voice. But well. I, I would say, yes, there are businesses that have a lot of different perspectives on how we ought to tackle the China, China challenge, but there's overwhelming consensus that part of the approach to China has to be an ambitious trade agenda for the region, um, that you really were really handicapping ourselves. One of the reasons why USMCA got such a strong vote, as you'll remember, is that President Trump had um, threatened to withdraw from NAFTA, and it served as a real catalyst, it really focused, I think, members of Congress on the costs of not passing that trade deal. And I think the China challenge has the opportunity to be the same kind of catalyst that presented with, um, with the risk of not pursuing a trade agenda. Okay, yeah. um, but very briefly, Mike, I know you want to say something because then I want to get Naima and, and Jay back. The only I was going to say is that I think we've got more of a consensus around the world on China now than we ever have, but including with our major trading partners, uh, but they are looking to us to lay out what the ultimate vision is of where we want to take the relationship. And we've yet to lay out what the end state or the new equilibrium should look like. They're worried that they're being caught in the middle of having to choose in a black and white world when it's a much more complex environment. And I think we'll have more success bringing the rest of the world with us if we lay out what that, what that ultimate new equilibrium should, should okay. be defined by. Joe, I think you wanted to say well, something. <clears throat> just to say I agree with Kristen. And I think the, if you go back to my metaphor and you take the top board of military competition, this administration has done some very good things like AUKUS or the working of the Quad with India. If you take the second board, which is extremely important, as we've just been saying, both the Trump administration and this administration have made a mistake in refusing the TPP that Mike negotiated. And if you look at RCEP, which is a weaker trade relationship, again, we're staying back from that. The net result is IPEF, which is a, is a pretty poor trade policy in terms of having a presence in the region. So when you look at the second board, uh, you have to realize that most countries in Asia do not want to be isolated from the China market. Uh, but they don't want the U.S. to go home. They want the U.S. essentially to stay to protect them militarily, which means we're working well on the top board. We're not working well on the second board. We could do a lot more there. Okay, so Naima, you're, I mean, given your extensive experience of China and your recent visit and the mood you've picked up, um, the um, analogy that Joe at the beginning rejected, I think it's not useful to compare this to the Cold War, and I apologize, I'm going to, or to contrast it actually, um, is that we seem to be, when it comes to the Taiwan Strait, and when it comes to these increased um, near misses that we keep seeing in, in the South China Sea, we seem to be um, in a pre-Cuba 1962 situation in the sense that we don't have routinized military to military information exchanges. We don't have these guardrails that were put in place by the USSR and the US after 1962. And therefore the fear is given Xi Jinping's explicit ambition um, by hook or by crook for Taiwan to come back to the motherland, um, we seem to be awaiting a Cuba kind of shock um, 
before we get those safety systems in place. Is that a fair, or is that too, is that too alarmist a, a characterization of where we are? I think that the thing that is the most concerning about our military to military relationship is the fact that the two people at the top can't talk to each other right now, right? So Secretary Austin in May made a request to meet with his counterpart in China, Li Shangfu, who's the Minister of uh, National Defense. Uh, that request was rejected. And the story behind this is, is complicated, but basically it's because in 2018, the US put sanctions on, on him because of uh, purchases of, of Russian arms when he was uh, in charge of equipment for the Chinese military. Those sanctions persist. China is very upset that they persist. China feels shafted, feels disrespected that a minister would have sanctions on him. And so therefore is not allowing the meeting to take place between Secretary Austin and um, Minister Lee. And that, it, that's it a didn't, problem. It didn't stop Dr. Kissinger from meeting. But <laughs> Dr. Kissinger just this past week did get to meet with Minister Lee. Um, so that's a problem because when we have these near misses, when uh, airplanes or, or ships are getting so close to each other and young people sort of who are at the helms are, are potentially gonna get hot-headed and, and lead us into a conflict we don't want, you need to have that kind of communication at the top level. Um, so I think that that's the big issue that we're going to have to deal with at some point to allow those types of conversations to take place. Something else I'll say though about my recent visit um, that I've heard many Chinese elites talk about is the fact that they are not convinced that commitments or statements made by President Biden that the US is not supportive of Taiwan independence are true. So basically there's a concern that those statements are there, but that really the US is supporting Taiwan independence uh, implicitly through other actions. Interestingly, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of attention to people who are not in the Biden administration and what they're saying about Taiwan. So there's attention to people who are former US officials. There's attention to what's happening in Congress. Um, and uh, so basically the claim that's made by Chinese elites is, look, US is saying one thing, but, but we think that the US is doing another thing. And so that leads me to two potential interpretations of what Chinese elites are saying right now. Number one, if the Biden administration continues to reiterate the line that it does not support Taiwan independence, if potentially some of those other voices are moderated a bit, then we're not at risk of serious confrontation. That's one interpretation. But there's another interpretation that regardless of what President Biden says, given that we are in a, in a US system where many people can express their viewpoints about issues all the time and the executive branch doesn't control what other people say, the Chinese elites could interpret what's happening in the US is as a form of belligerence and a determination to move forward in supporting Taiwan independence. And that's a really dangerous scenario. And I don't think that there is a, a jury is out yet. I don't think that there is a de definitive plan by Xi Jinping to take Taiwan by force. I think, it's, I think that when they say that that plan is not in place, I believe that. Um, but I think that there are many potential possibilities and what happens in the next few years will determine what happens in the long run. So essentially, sorry, forgive me for being an FT person, but you're saying that Xi Jinping is a bit like the Fed. He's going to be data-driven um, on, on, on whether Taiwan's going to be retaken by force or not. That it will depend on his interpretation of what's coming out of Washington on the One China policy. I was going to say it's going to depend on interpretation of data by Xi Jinping. Well, that's what the Fed does anyway, right? Um, <laughs> Joe, um, tell me if this is a fair characterization. We have Balloon Gate, whatever you call it, earlier this year, which blows everything off course after the relatively positive summit between Biden and Xi Jinping in Bali last November. Um, the Chinese then, um, at least in good interpretation of what the Chinese, had, um, how they respond to this is, think, well, basically Biden is a, a prisoner of hawks in Washington, people like Mike Gallagher, who describe us as techno totalitarian, etc., and we don't really want to engage with them whilst whilst he's a, a creature of hawks. Since then, though, beginning with Jake Sullivan's prolonged series of conversations with Wang Yi in Vienna, and then subsequently the Secretary Blinken visit, the Secretary Yellen visit, 
and more to come. Um, it seems as though the Biden administration has, in Chinese eyes, regained control uh, of the agenda and isn't so much prone to looking over its own shoulder at the hawks on Capitol Hill and more generally in the foreign policy community in Washington. Do you think that's, A, a fair description of what has happened, and B, of how China is interpreting things? Well, it, it may be fair, Ed, but it places too much of the emphasis on the U.S. changes in the Biden administration. I think, uh, as you know, the, it takes two to tango. The Chinese basically changed their policy toward the United States after the financial crisis. They dropped Deng Xiaoping's uh, hide and bide, and that then as economic power goes down, the growth slows down, for legitimization of party control, they switch from economic progress to nationalism. And Xi Jinping then gives that an extra boost. Uh, so I think if you look at the, at the history of this, the, uh, the origins of the current downturn really have deeper roots on the Chinese side. And if you talk to the people in the American side of this dance, uh, the first meeting with the Chinese in Anchorage, which was in January uh, 21, they said the Chinese came on very strong. It wasn't as though the Americans came on strong, it was the Chinese who came on strong. I think this is changing not just because the Biden administration is trying to manage it, I think it has to do with the slowdown of economic growth in China. Uh, you know, if China has huge economic problems. Its labor force peaked in 2015. Uh, productivity, which is the solution to a labor force peaking, uh, pro total factor productivity in China has been going down, and it's among the lower tier of the OECD countries. Um, and I think Xi Jinping realizes this, as well as people around him. I think they realize that too high a level of conflict with the US, whether driven by Taiwan or anything else, is not in their interests. So I think, yes, the Biden administration has been managing the pro pro problem a bit differently than it did uh, a couple of years ago. But I would place more of the emphasis on the changes in China. So I think, I can't remember who it was yesterday. It might have been um, Frank Fukuyama who said that um, there were two great mistakes by autocrats in the last two, three years. One was Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and the other was um, the zero COVID um, um, policy in China, which not just promote, uh, provoked protests and then led to double COVID overnight. Um, uh, the lifting of all the restrictions, but it's also really killed Chinese growth. We're in kind of a double dip recession in China now. And that's what you would attribute um, as being a more important factor here, is they're yeah, much I, more worried. But, and, and the COVID, the zero COVID was a huge mistake. Um, but what I was trying to suggest is the Chinese economic problems were already developing before zero COVID. Okay. Um, so what happens to... Uh, the America-China relationship if Trump is re-elected. Mike. Uh, I don't have a license to practice politics, but uh, representing a nonpartisan organization now. Uh, look, I, I think we're likely to see more continuity than change, as we've seen from Trump to, to Biden uh, in, in many respects. So I, I'm not sure uh, it would be as, uh, in terms of the China relationship, I'm not sure it would be as uh, disruptive or is different uh, going, going forward. You know, I think if, as we look back, one of the things as, as you uh, made reference to earlier is that we sort of had the assumption that if we engaged China, we pulled them into the international system, they would become more like us. They would sort of listen to and follow the global rules and sort of reform at least economically, maybe even politically. That obviously proved to be that, that they have reformed a lot, but it hasn't been as linear, it hasn't gone as far, and it's been reversed in some important respects. What's happened in the meantime is actually we've become more like them. And so we now engage in industrial policy, we engage in protectionism, uh, we've taken steps that are at odds with sort of global uh, trading, uh, trading rules. Um, and I think that's out of frustration that um, having spent years, and I, I see Penny here, Pritzker here, yeah, we spent years warning the Chinese that if we didn't make progress on these outstanding economic issues, 
support for a constructive relationship in the U.S. would disappear. And that's exactly what, what has happened. And so out of frustration that they didn't become more like us, there's a little bit of if we can't beat them, join them, and let's play their game and try and play it better than, than they do in this new form of competition. I would expect that to continue to be the way going forward uh, under Trump. What concerns me, of course, is the rest of the world who is on pins and needles about whether the first Trump administration was an aberration in American political history or the sign of what is to come and their willingness to cooperate with us, collaborate with us, which is where a lot of our strength comes from, I think will turn um, in, in a very significant way on the outcome of that election. Um, I guess you don't want to talk politics either. Oh, but no, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk politics. I mean, to me, the, one of the biggest impacts of a Trump election would be a return to uh, strategic ambiguity on Taiwan and not the kind of half-hearted attempt at ambiguity the Biden administration um, has attempted, but genuine ambiguity in the sense that it might not be clear in the president's mind what an appropriate U.S. response would be to Chinese military action on Taiwan. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that's pretty consequential, whether that election has implications in terms of the United States' credible deterrence. Um, Professor and I would have better thoughts about that. Um, and then, of course, the impact on our ability to work with allies in terms of, in terms of generating, you know, support for a concerted strategy on China. To me, one of the things for a non-Trump Republican election is continuity. Actually, I think you'd see lots of continuity between the Biden administration and the non-Trump Republicans in terms of aggressive use of our export controls and national security tools and also some um, willingness to consider parts of industrial policy. Okay, before we go to audience questions, I want to ask one sort of bigger question um, to each of you about what America's ultimate goal, regardless of which president's in power, but you know, keeping Biden in mind, I guess, at forefront of mind, what America's ultimate goal is here? Because if we're, if we're going to contrast rather than, than, than compare with the Cold War, the Cold War, it was always imaginable it would end because the Soviet system was an ideological system. Um, it wasn't in our minds a, a Cold War with Russia, it was a Cold War with an ideology. And one ideology or the other would prevail. Is this a contest with the Chinese communist system? Or does it go beyond that? Is this great power rivalry between China and US in perpetuity? What's our strategic end game here? Joe, and then Naima. Well, I think the end game is different from the Cold War. Remember in the Cold War when George Kennan uh, elucidated the doctrine of containment in the 40s, he said we have to contain the Soviet Union and then eventually because of its own internal contradictions it will collapse. Kennan was correct but it took 40 years. Uh, I think with the relationship with China uh, we don't know what kind of internal system they're going to have but what we have to do is manage a competition which is going to go on for a long time. And part of our objective is to make sure the competition goes on. It's not clear that a collapse inside China would necessarily make the world safer for us. Uh, and it's also true that if we blunder into an over-exaggeration of Chinese strength and wind up with a situation like August 1914, where everybody thinks a short, sharp war will clarify the balance of power and wind up with four years which kill 10 million people and destroy four regimes, that would be a terrible outcome for us, for China, and for the world. So I have argued that the goal we should have is similar to what Australian Ambassador Kevin Rudd has called uh, managed competition, or sometimes people call it cooperative competition. But to think that our goal should be ultimately prevailing, as we did with the Soviets, I think is the bridge too far. Do you agree with that? I like where you ended up. Um, I, a lot of people say that there is now a consensus on China, that the left and the right both have the same idea about China. I tend to disagree. I think the left and the right agree that there are things that are threatening and concerning about China that need to be handled. 
but increasingly we're starting to see differences in how Republicans and Democrats view the China challenge, but even within the Democrats and even within the Biden administration, I think that there are differences. And so you asked what the US goal is, and I think that the goal is different within the administration. I think some have a very broad goal and it has to do with uh, ideology. It has to do with fighting back against authoritarian influence on other parts of the world. I think that some have a more narrow view of protecting US interests, bolstering, bolstering US industry and economy against a China that has a very different value set and also a very different um, ability to compete in the world, right? And so I don't think we're all of one accord. It's a very well-made point. We've got time for a couple of very quick questions. Um, the lady here in the front and then the gentleman there. Uh, but please, shortish questions. Thank you. Um, my name is Esther. I'm with Foreign Policy for America, but here as a, on the Rising Leaders Program. Question, I wanted to raise a question about the, the assumption that um, the military relationship is all zero sum. It strikes me that if we can get to some kind of nuclear arms control discussions or agreements, that, that can be a positive sum relationship. And then if we have time, can, how can we ensure that the political rhetoric we're seeing, especially in Congress, does not reduce the space for diplomacy, flexibility, and the space to reduce tension? Thank, Thank you, you. Naima. Um, so on your first point, I, I accept that. I think that making some sort of a nuclear agreement would be in the interest of both sides. So I won't argue against that. I think you're right. Um, I want to talk about diplomacy because What's astounding to me is that I'm a former diplomat, I'm, I'm pro-diplomacy, and I, I've started to see people on both sides, the US and the Chinese side, talk about diplomacy as if it's something that is a reward for good behavior. But I think diplomacy is important no matter what. You've got to talk to each other regardless of whether you're getting along or not. People think of diplomacy as something that's always conciliatory and always sort of like being friendly to the other side, but you can condemn and be diplomatic, you can uh, sanction, you can, you can talk you know, in an aggressive manner, but you still need to talk. And so I do worry that the increasingly negative rhetoric in Congress will stymie our ability to have Jen, diplomatic conversations. Can I just take two seconds to say the military relationship uh, is often uh, zero sum when it's competing for influence and a balance of power. But let's not forget what Kristen said properly. It can also be negative sum. If we blunder into a war with China, a la 1914, the metaphor I used, we can both be worse off. And then very brief final question from the, the, the gentleman there. Uh, David, I'd like to injure a concerned citizen. Naima, uh, I was a little confused by what you were saying about how you perceive uh, Xi's view and the elite's view, but related to that, this is a yes or no question. Do you believe that by the US uh, ramping up its efforts to turn Taiwan into a porcupine will deter Xi or not? Classic security dilemma. So everything that the U.S. is doing right now is being interpreted as ramping up in a way that is belligerent. However, I think that this is something that political scientists have to deal with all the time. Um, so my answer to you is maybe. <laughs> Thank you to the panel. Wonderful discussion and to be continued. <laughs>